It's time to take a ride on the Steelers Afternoon Drive with our co-hosts, Alan Saunders and Zachary Smith. Welcome to another episode of Steelers Afternoon Drive. I'm Zachary Smith. He's back. Alan Saunders back on the episode today. DB, shout out to him for filling in yesterday, but we got Alan Saunders back. Alan, how we doing? I'm doing good. Appreciate the uh, long weekend and uh, glad to be back. Fired up. It's game week. Tomlin Tuesday. Ready to go. Ready to go. Hey, great segue. You, you, you set it up on a tee for me. I'm normally the one that's setting it up on a tee, but Tomlin Tuesday, the first one of the season, a lot of topics to dive into based off of that. I don't want to start with the offensive line. I feel like they're going to be kind of the, uh, the meat and potatoes of this episode. Uh, we knew Isaac Samalo wasn't going to go in this one. Uh, we knew Spencer Anderson or felt pretty good about Spencer Anderson getting the first crack did name him the starting left guard. Um, but you know, we're going to get into it deeper in the episode. Maybe somebody that we expected to be named a starting position. That didn't happen. That's just a little bit of a teaser for later on in the episode. But now in the state of this offensive line, uh, one, uh, with Samalo not going on IR or anything like that, could he maybe not miss as much time as we thought? Or do you still think you're looking at probably like week four, best case scenario, week five, best case scenario? Uh, I mean, I haven't heard anything specific. I, I doubt we'll probably get anything specific until he starts to get back on the field. You know, th- like right yeah, now, yeah. the way these injuries usually work is if you say like, oh, it's about a four week injury, you're going to spend two weeks not doing anything, right? It's like, just stay off mm-hmm. it. Okay. And, you know, so this is a pack. So you know, he can still run. He can still, you know, do cardio and, and lift legs and maybe back or some other stuff like that, but he's not going to be doing anything with that injured area. Then the second part of it is you start to do the rehab for the injured area. So you'll see guys out there with like, uh, you know, rubber bands, you know, doing like physical therapy type exercises. The reaction to those generally determines how fast a player can return from an injury. So until he gets to that point, I don't think we're going to hear anything more than the about a month, that we already have because it really just depends on how he responds to that treatment uh, about how quickly he could get back there. I would say about a month, you know, sounds reasonable though. Um, We've seen players play through this uh, with less time off than that. Uh, Lynn and Roberts, I think only missed one week last year uh, Mm -hmm. for a slightly less severe uh, version of this injury. Obviously TJ missed, what was it? Seven um, Mm -hmm. in 2022. So, I mean, you kind of have the range there. I would say four sounds reasonable, um, but could be two, could be six. You know, I, I wouldn't rule either of those out at this point. Um, yeah, probably won't know for another couple of weeks. Yeah, that's fair. Um, we talked about, you know, Spencer Anderson, both of us thinking that he would be the first guy in line to get those reps. You've been impressed with him. I feel like we brought him up uh, more than I've seen a lot of other people uh, just because of the spring that he had, the training camp that he had. You called him one of the more improved players and one of the more impressive players from where you thought he was his starting point at this season to where he's at right now. It looks like he's going to get the first crack at that left guard spot. Did it surprise you that Tomlin stayed at that, though, or that we didn't have to wait until kind of like literally game day to see how they just went up and lined up? No. It didn't um, because I don't really feel like this was a mystery or anything that the Steelers were still working out internally. I, th- I thought they had pretty well decided that Spencer Anderson was going to be the guy that he had earned that opportunity. Um, and they just kind of went with it. I don't think there was any drama in this decision uh, for the Steelers. I thought he was compared to expectations, the best offensive lineman on the team for a training camp. I thought, you know, him focusing on guard was a fantastic development for his, his game. And so didn't surprise me at all that it was Anderson. It didn't surprise me at all that Tom acknowledged it because it was obvious. It was it was not something where uh, he's not breaking any news to the team by telling us that. You know, sometimes he'll mm-hmm. he'll him and haw because he wants guys to have that carrot right to feel like they're going into the practice week still having a chance to earn something. I think it was pretty clear to everyone that Spencer Anderson was going to start this game. Yeah, no, that, that, that's fair, too. Uh, as far as the offensive line goes, as soon as you jumped on here, you said that's what you wanted to talk about, and it wasn't necessarily related to the things that we've already discussed. So, Alan, I'm going to just give you the floor and see where you wanted to take this offensive line conversation from this point. I'm just so frustrated. I'm, I'm tired, boss. I'm tired. About like the, the, the conversation about this team's management of the offensive line, like if I get one more person that – 
sends me a tweet that involves the words natural position. I'm going to find a way to go through Twitter. I'm going to get Elon Musk to give me a portal where I can actually go through and strangle you like Homer strangles Bart Simpson if you if you send me those words again. I don't understand where this narrative came from. It doesn't exist. It's not a thing that exists. Every offensive lineman I've ever met has played more than one position. Some of them are better at it than others. There is no such thing as a natural position. And what the Steelers are doing right now with their offensive line makes a ton of sense. There's no other options, in fact, really. Like, I don't know what – what is Mike Tomlin supposed to say other than Troy Fontano is not practicing fully yet, which means he's not even cleared to play yet. Mm-hmm. The, uh, the options to tackle are Dan Moore and Broderick Jones. We know where they're going to play. Dan Moore is very bad at right tackle. Broderick Jones seems about even at both. I, I just uh, – I don't understand what where this continues to keep coming from, why it's a thing. Um, Roderick Jones is not being harmed in any way by playing right tackle. It's he's just not. I, I don't he's not nothing is being wasted, not no one is being hurt. Uh I, I just it, I, the whole thing doesn't make any sense. Someone was mad at me today that they're playing Mason McCormick at right guard. If there's a, <laughs> there is no difference between left guard and right guard. Like there's just none. I get there's nobody out there that's like awful at right guard and great at left guard. That person doesn't exist. Like it's it's a fantasy. I don't know where it came from. I, I don't understand. And and Mason McCormick is a fourth round draft pick who's essentially drafted to be a backup. He's got to be able to play all three. He's got to be able to play left guard, center, and right guard, or you can't be on the team. Like I, mm-hmm. I, I don't understand this obsession that that has been created about where the offensive linemen play. Like. Oh, well, he played there his uh, first game in junior high, so now you can never move him again. Sorry. He's just a left tackle forever. Like, that's not the way it works. Offensive linemen are largely interchangeable. It's not that big of a deal. In, in Broderick's case, let me ask you, if you would you feel differently if there weren't the injuries that have taken place? Like, if Fatanu uh, was healthy, um, you know, if, if I, I mean, I guess you could keep Dylan Cook as part of the equation too, and even Broderick himself with his elbow, uh, and they were still like kind of moving him around as opposed to just figuring out where they wanted Troy to be and where they wanted Broderick to be. I mean, I think they probably could have had a clear plan coming into this offseason when it didn't really look that clear, but I think the plan mm-hmm. was always to let Troy win the right tackle battle when he could win it and then move Broderick to left tackle. And see if he could win that. I think the injury yeah. has certain the, the two injuries have certainly delayed those processes. Like I would not put Broderick Jones at left tackle right now if he continues to look the way he did in the preseason. Like that's not going to work. He's going to get Russell Wilson killed. Like I, sure. If Troy Fontana comes back and looks like the better option to right tackle, then Troy's going to play him. Broderick's not. I mean, that's if he's going to if Troy Fontana comes back and he doesn't look like the better option to right tackle then Broderick's going to play and Troy's not. I, you know, like, I, mm-hmm. I understand that that's not, like, you know, what people want to see from the first-round pick, but, you, you know, injuries happen. You have to acknowledge that they're part of the game and that, that you know, they <laughs> you're, they don't care about your plans. Um, and so Broderick's not re- fully healthy. Fatanu's not fully healthy. That You know, figure it out. At some point, they get both fully healthy. I'm pretty sure they'll both be playing. And, like, this thing, like Broderick Jones, when I was scouting him, I said, like, he looks like a right tackle to me. I still think he would be better at right tackle than left tackle. He struggles in pass protection. Those struggles are seriously mitigated when you put them in front of the quarterback instead of behind him, especially his tendency to lose inside quickly. Like, that is not as big of a deal when it happens right in the quarterback's face as it does when it happens on his blind side. I, I just, right. you know, that's like a big thing. Like everybody thinks that this ma- that there was like this magic in moving Kevin Dotson from right guard to left guard. No, no, his mistakes just happened in front of the quarterback, and so they didn't end up with Kenny Pickett concussed when he was at right guard instead of left guard. Those mistakes still happened. They just he was always a player that most of the reps looked good, and then occasionally there were some some hiccups. It's just that the hiccups are a lot easier to deal with in the quarterback's face. I don't know whether Broderick Jones is a left tackle or right tackle. I think that story is yet to be written. He's a young guy. They'll figure it out. But, like, where he played in college is completely irrelevant to that conversation. It has yeah. absolutely zero to do with it. Like, it, it it doesn't matter. If Broderick Jones was playing in, at Georgia, and Georgia at that time had the two best tackles that had ever played NFL football, had ever played college football, 
they were playing left tackle and right tackle, and Georgia chose to play Broderick Jones at guard, it would not change who Broderick Jones is the player now. If Georgia had played him at right tackle or at left tackle, it would not change the player that Broderick Jones is now. Like The reason Dan Moore has never been able to play right tackle is because Dan Moore isn't very good. And so the Steelers have just given him the thing that he already knew and was already good at because they were just trying to get him by, and they didn't want to give him anything more that made it even 1% more difficult. But most players can play both sides. James Daniels has played both sides and center. He played tackle in college. Like, it doesn't matter. Like, there's just, it's just not that big of a deal. I think for me, I, I 100% agree in terms of I don't care which side it's going to be on. And I think I've given them, obviously, some more grace. Not that they need it from me. But in terms of the plan, because of the way the injuries have kind of impacted things here. But I am of the mindset, whether it is on the left or right side, I would like to see him just get those reps there and stay in one spot. Because I don't think he's been good enough at either spot to just say to, to have that flexibility. Like I'd rather just see him set in stone and work in one spot. Similarly to what you're saying with Dan Moore, hopefully he's a better player than Dan Moore, obviously, but I would like to just see them hone in on one thing and get really good at one thing on one side. Uh, and, and that obviously their plans have been impacted by that, but I'm still hopeful that that's what they end up doing as opposed to just, you know, is it going to be at left? Is it going to be at right? And we still have these questions, you know, down the road. Yeah, I'm not sure that we have a clear answer on who should be the left tackle. Like, I, I don't, I don't know what the, what the right answer there is as to which of those two guys should mm -hmm. be playing left tackle. Like, I, like, I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't think the Steelers no. know either. I think they were really to be honest. That... When they drafted Troy, if you would have asked me, I, I would have said I think he should play left tackle and Broderick right. I think Fatanu's. Pro well, before the injury, I thought Fatano would be the better player coming into this year. But missing mm -hmm. a month of mm -hmm. practice at the end of training camp as a rookie is like rookie season threatening. Like, there are rookies who would be starters day one that if they missed the entire last month of the preseason – should not play at all then at that point. Like that's how big of a deal that time is for development for a rookie. It is huge. Um, and so, you know, just because they intended to start him doesn't mean that they can now just because they, that was the initially the plan and it doesn't do anybody any good to say what the plan is when you know, it might change. Yeah. No, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. So in your mind though, I think that you said this while answering that are kind of going through all of that you still think eventually though it is troy and broderick as the two tackles just not sure which side which one's going to play on yeah i mean dan moore is under contract for this year he's not coming back like they'll figure it out like th those guys are going to be the starting tackles for probably the next well certainly the next what three four years uh, and probably a long time after that oh there's there's plenty of time to figure it out i just you know i think I, Broderick Jones is certainly not being harmed by playing some right tackle here. I, I, I don't understand. And like, like I said, like the person's mad about Mason McCormick playing right guard. And oh, stuff. That, yeah, guard. Like, yeah, what are we doing? Like, I just, I, mm -hmm. you, know, you know where Mason McCormick played in high school? Right tackle. That's where he played as a senior in high school. Yeah. Can't believe they're playing him at guard. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we watch these guys come out of college. Three quarters of college linemen cannot play the same position they played in college in the NFL. Maybe, maybe seven eighths can't play the yeah. same position. The really good players play left tackle. The, the the good tall ones play left tackle. The slightly less good tall ones play right tackle. The ones are too short play guard, and the ones are too skinny play center. Like they all got to move to some slot, or they're just not going to make it in the NFL. That's why the Steelers drafted Kendrick Green and moved him to center because he's not big enough to play guard in the NFL and be very good at it. So he had to move if he's going to have a future. Now, it just turns out he's not going to have much of a future. He's going to be a backup guard. Whatever, that's fine. For a fourth-round pick or third-round third, third round pick, you probably don't want a backup guard with a third-round pick. Like, that, that that was not an okay solution for the Steelers. But, I mean, mm -hmm. that's probably what he should have been all along, you know. Um, sure. Like, that, that's just... Do we know where Kendrick... Did Kendrick Green play any tackle in high school? probably i you know i feel like ev i feel like every nfl off i don't want to say every but the majority let of me NFL say this there is a point tackle. in every nfl offensive lineman's career where they played tackle whether that yeah. was in high school or junior high or or peewee or whatever but there is a point in every nfl lineman's career where they played 
tackle. I'm almost positive about it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so along that offensive line, Spencer Anderson was named the starter. On the defensive side of things, Beanie Bishop, who is listed as the only slot corner on the roster, was not named the starting slot corner. And Spencer Anderson was. So it's very, you know, like the same sort of. And yeah. so that's where I think like Tomlin still wants to see those guys compete between Beanie Bishop and Thomas Graham this week. That's why he's not naming a starter there. I still do expect it will be Beanie Bishop, but he wants to leave. You know, He has the option, obviously, to make Thomas Graham a practice squad eligible, but he wants to make it known that that's still something that he's considering. He's not just, uh, you know, saying, oh, yeah, Beanie, you're the starter. Like you, you've st still got to earn it this week. I think that's reasonable for an undrafted free agent. Also, another guy coming off an injury. You know, I, I think that's uh, something that you can't discount. It doesn't matter how good a player looked in April if they're hurt in August and they're not ready to play. Like it, it's mm -hmm. it's very different. So you brought up Thomas Graham. See, my mind went to, you know, are we going to see him obviously in some run packages? But could we even see more snaps from whether it's like the three safety stuff that they're going to do? Or could it even be a bigger body guy that they're looking for in those snaps, like a Corey Trice? Like, that's kind of where my mind went to. It didn't necessarily go right to Thomas Graham. No, I think it's Thomas Graham for me. Um, I mean, they will use Deshaun Elliott a lot in this game. I think Deshaun Elliott is going to mm -hmm. be the guy that draws most of the uh, pits assignments. I, I think that that seems uh, reasonable, but I, I don't think that they're going to look at any of those other options as replacements for Beanie Bishop as a traditional slot corner. Uh, the Falcons certainly with Ray Ray McLeod have a very traditional slot coverage matchup option that you need a traditional. So, I mean, I, I don't want Deshaun Elliott covering Ray Ray McLeod, like with all due respect, like that's, that's a bad matchup for the Steelers. I would rather have Beanie Bishop or Thomas Graham or someone of that size and ability in there against Ray Ray McLeod. So to me, I think you need them both. Uh, certainly when they go to mm -hmm. tight ends or when they have pits flexed out, you know, you can use Elliott for that. If they want to run B. John Robinson in certain, you know, pass catching areas, I think Elliott is very useful for covering him as well. Uh, but mm -hmm. I don't want I don't want Elliott against Ray Ray McLeod. That that's a that's a mismatch. This is maybe something that uh you know should be saved for Friday because it's more of a matchup thing. But like <clears throat> Zach Robinson, first year offensive coordinator, so you know we don't know exactly what how he's going to tweak the McVay offense, but that's how he learned under. And you want to talk about eleven personnel, like you should see a lot of three wide receiver sets. So to your point, yeah, Ray Ray McLeod probably gonna play a lot of snaps. Darnell Mooney, you probably gonna play a lot of snaps for them so it will be interesting to see the way that they match up but i'm yeah i like that the sean elliott kyle pitts matchup certainly would be a fun one to watch the back and forth on that because i know i was only there a couple days but just from listening to you talk about it talking with pat about it the pat farm with the sean elliott back and forth during training camp were certainly a battle yep i i think that's definitely a matchup to watch here in this game one i'm really looking forward to I, you know I, I think the way the steelers attack this this atlanta offense is very interesting to me um I don't really think there's anybody on this. Like Drake London's a good player. Like, mm -hmm. I I don't even know if he warrants like following him with Joey Porter. Like it's not like he's you know I I just I mean he's he's a bigger guy, so I think it's a better matchup for Porter than it is for uh, right. Uh, I'm yeah, thinking more the body type than the than ability. The ability. Itself. Yeah, 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 right. But like it's not like he's some guy that you're like, oh my god, what are we gonna do? Like oh they have Drake London. Like it, it's not that kind of matchup. Um, B. John Robinson's a very good player, special athlete, but I don't think he's anything they haven't seen before. And Kirk Cousins, I mean, I, I like is he going to be the same player after the injury with less mobility at his age? I think this is going to go down as like an awful contract. Uh, and so we'll see where he's at. But I don't really think there are too many of the, you know, sometimes it's easy for us to say, like, what's the best matchup for Kyle Pitts? And it's out oh, to Sean Elliott. Mm -hmm. There you go. But sometimes it's hard to do that because there are other matchups that you have to maneuver around as well. You know, like it would be one thing to say like, Oh, what's the best matchup for uh, Mark Andrews? Oh, well it's Deshaun Elliott, but also what's the best option to spy Lamar Jackson? Oh, it's Deshaun Elliott. Well, now you can't, you got to pick, right? Okay. But I don't think yeah. Atlanta has anything that is going to make you come off that matchup with the rest of this offense. That makes me feel like I should, maybe if they're going to put Bijan outside the formation, that would be the one thing where I would, you'd maybe kind of have to decide other than that. Like, I think you can just say 25, go get him. Like he's yours. Yeah. I like it. I'm looking forward to it. Um, 
along with obviously Spencer Anderson being named the starter with Beanie Bishop not being given that starting job right out the gate. Uh, the wide receiver room, uh, the confidence that Tomlin said that he had in it and didn't mention, you know, necessarily George by name. I think we all know that he's the alpha, the guy at the top there, but he mentioned guys like Van Jefferson and Scotty Miller for the consistency. Uh, I believe was the word that he said uh, that they showed throughout the process and giving him more confidence in the room. Uh, Alan, I, I'm not going to speak for you, but uh, I don't know that I can share that same sentiment as, as Tomlin does. I'll uh, I'll split the difference here. Like I'll okay. say that when I got to training camp compared to what I saw in the spring, I was much more impressed with what I saw from Van Jefferson and Scotty Miller in that setting when the pads went on. I felt like they both looked better than I expected them to at Latrobe and in the preseason. And I do think mm -hmm. they were very consistent as opposed to like we talked about. I thought Calvin Austin was very good in the spring and then kind of fell off, right? You didn't see it. Roman Wilson, yeah. the other way, was not very good in the spring, started to show a little bit, but then got hurt. Um, Quez Watkins obviously saw the, the speed, but the hands weren't there. I, you know, I thought those two guys, Van Jefferson, Scotty Miller, did show consistency, and I did think they were better than I expected them to be from about the beginning of training camp on. I, I agree with both those statements. I don't know that that would give me comfort in this wide receiver room, though. And I, you know, I got that. That just doesn't. I understand the coaching mindset. And I talk about this a lot where, like, if you have one player who's 50% of the time is an A and 50% of the time is an F, and you have another player that is 100% of the time of the C, the coach will always take the 100% C. They will never want the 50% A, 50% F, even though 50% of those are A's and they're better. They would always rather have the C they can depend on than, than the 50% A that they can't. And so I maybe that's where Mike Tomlin is getting some of this comfort, uh, this confidence, but these guys are C's. Let's, let's just call it what it is. One of those things that you said there to me was much more important than the other because that's true. Consistency wouldn't necessarily mean a good thing, though. Like If they're consistently just like here – what does it matter? Cause they're still not necessarily improving the room, but the fact that they got better in the, you know, once the pads came on uh, in the, you know, later portions, as opposed to in the spring, I think that's the bigger part of that. Alan breaking news as we are on the podcast here though, Steelers and Cam Hayward have agreed to a three year, $45 million deal that includes $29 million in new money and 16 million fully guaranteed. Uh, this getting done before Pat, it's a new deal. Well, $16 million fully guaranteed is just what they owed him this year anyway, right? Mm. So yeah. that's basically yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no new guarantee. I mean, it wasn't guaranteed before, but the Steelers were not cutting Cam Hayward before this season. So that's mm -hmm. basically no new guaranteed money on this deal. Um, and then so the $16 million that's this year, so then you have $29 million over the next two years. None of that new $29 million is guaranteed. Uh, yeah, I think that's a pretty good deal. Um, does it surprise you three years? Well, no, it'll be this year and two more. That'll be the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So right. no, I mean, that's what he said he wanted. I think he that's what he said it. he wanted. I just, I think that there, yeah. were, that to me was probably, I don't know if there was internally, but I kept saying to people that were asking me about it. I wondered if that was the sticking point, like where there was maybe some contention is going to the three as opposed to two, like adding just one year. And instead they're adding to. Yeah. I mean, I, and it makes sense for the salary cap too. Like there's, you know, you can't just dump it all in one year. Like this is better. It, it, it smooths out the salary cap hit over, over a couple seasons. So I mean, yeah. I, yeah. No problem. No problem with this deal on the way that you look at it. No, I, I don't think so. I mean, 14 and a half, not like the thing is that if he's not very good, you can cut him after this season with just as much as you were going to owe him anyway. Like that's the, that's the, the part of this that like, there's basically no risk to the Steelers here. Yeah. Jeremy Fowler's one to put this out. And the last thing of it, just uh, his signing bonus is nearly 15 million is the other part of that as well. Which is what they owed him this year anyway. So yeah, it's going to, I mean, it's it's a traditional like they're gonna cut his salary. To, this makes a bunch of salary cap space probably. I mean, I'll have to wait and see the details to see how it's structured, but mm -hmm. I mean that's okay. 
Yeah. All right. Yeah. I mean, I don't have issues with it. Like I said, I, I thought that the, maybe the one thing would be um, from the Steelers standpoint was curious if they would go the two additional years tacked on along with this year as opposed to just one. I thought maybe that would be the, the contention if there was any and why this ha- wasn't getting done. And, you know, we were getting this close to the season. I thought that would maybe be the reason. But, uh, yeah, no issue with this from from me either as somebody that was. I don't want to say skeptical. I definitely was nowhere near because Alan, we t- we had like a an episode where we talked a lot about this uh, with a fan base. Maybe I, I don't know if surprising is the right word, but a, a little bit surprising to you and I how you know people were talking about the Cam Hayward situation. Yeah, I I I mean Cam Hayward's a great player. I I just think that's the part of it that like I, I think a lot of people are missing is that even last year was pretty good like very clearly playing not fully healthy so um yeah i mean will he get back to being the 2022 version of himself i don't know i probably wouldn't bet on it but he doesn't need to to make 14 and a half million dollars a season not guaranteed um mm-hmm. m- makes sense like that that's you'd give that deal to almost anybody like if he's not good you just cut him and it doesn't hurt you like i, I don't you know that's it's a very good deal for the Steelers. I, I don't understand why anyone would be against this. Like it's 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 almost risk free. You weren't going to cut Cam Hayward for this year at this point, and that's the only thing you're really adding in terms of risk. So, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah I mean, nowhere near the the not that like the you know average per year would mean a ton. Like it's more about the guaranteed money, but nowhere near the average per year that people were throwing out there, thinking like it was going to be. 20 plus per I don't understand and... why people thought that he was asking for a lot of money. I think like people got confused about like him refusing to take Top a five. Pay cut this year with oh, like yeah. saying he wanted more than that going forward. Like the last year of your deal is intentionally inflated so that it can serve exactly this purpose so that it can be the starting point for a negotiation on the next one. Like that's how his contract was, was set up. He's not going to take a pay cut and give away the leverage that he built into his own last contract at this point. No, you do exactly what he did and say, give me an extension, and then we'll pay that money forward. And now he gets some guaranteed money, and the Steelers had him for two more years for basically no risk. I like This is the way it was supposed I I really believe that this contract probably could have been done a month and a half ago, but they were waiting to see whether they needed his money for Brandon Ayuk. It is interesting that this looks like this is a push all the money out of 2024 deal. This is the way it would structure if I would have structured it if that's what they were looking to do. So does this mean more than just a Pat Farmer's extension coming up? It's certainly possible, but this could clear all but up. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to try to do the math live on the air, but all right, maybe I am. This could this could clear all but about like seven million from his cap hit this year. So like that that's really not you got my mind going. Like what else at this point could we be talking about besides a Pat Farmuth extension? Oh, Jalen Warren extension, a Justin Fields or Russell Wilson extension, a an unexpected James Daniels extension. I don't know. Hey, I um, threw a um yeah. I threw like somebody asked me if there was one player that nobody's talked about getting an extension that's gonna get one, who would it be? I said, low key, what about a Landon? I mean, he don't think it'll cost anywhere near this amount of money, but yeah, sure. I mean, sure. Um, so I had it down here like on a on two more new years, you could cut cams uh they, they could trim nine point eight six million from his uh 2024 cap hit so you take his cap hit from 25.4 down to 15.5 okay but i mean you could easily eat all that up in a couple contract extensions like that that's not that big of a deal yeah Absolutely. Um, Al, I did have one question that we wanted to, to get to here real quick before we get out of here. Uh, someone said, in theory, special packages for Justin Fields sound good, uh, but can the new OC fake or disguise it? Cordell Stewart had a big arm or a bigger arm than Fields, and it was successful sometimes. But if he goes on the field, will it draw attention uh, and make it too predictable? Got to dream up better stuff than they had. I think Cordell Stewart was awesome as Slash, and you could make a good argument that they should have just kept him there instead of trying to make him this team's starting quarterback. Um, I don't 
think like the thing is is that here's the thing you have to have a big enough package of plays in that you are not repetitive when you go into it you cannot just give him one thing to do or yes it will be predictable but i have full faith in arthur smith to not be predictable that is the last thing i'm worried about him I'm worried about him coming up with like too cute stuff, which certainly could be a risk with Justin Fields, where you're trying to do mm-hmm. too much. Um, yeah, absolutely. It's like, oh, let's run, let's put Russ in a quarterback and Justin Fields a wide receiver, and then we're gonna run a reverse, and then Fields is gonna pass it to George Pickens, and like there's four fumbles on the play. Like, yeah, absolutely like that you could be concerned about. Him not being creative enough to disguise it, I wouldn't worry about that. Yeah. I mean. <clears throat> yeah, I agree. I love that we're, we're talking about Cordell Stewart in the year 2024. Man ahead of his time. I was asking you about him because I was like, I didn't even get to see a ton of slash for people watching and listening to the show. That might be egregious, but keep in, mo- keep in mind, I was born in 1995. So Slash had a huge arm, man. He could throw the ball down the field uh, with anybody. He was not the world's most accurate underneath passer. Um, I don't know if I agree with the contention that he had a better arm than Fields, but it was the deep ball was yeah that's what we were the, we were discussing what does better ball mean ball. yeah like we just talked about distance or like velocity because i think that there's a, a difference there and maybe it's one and one between the two with the answer to those yeah yeah i'd agree with that and i don't know that either of them is particularly accurate you know i just think the NFL world was not ready for a player like Cordell Stewart. And I wonder what they could have done with him if, if they were, but uh, yeah, that was, uh, I mean, I, he wasn't, the thing is like, it's hard to compare him because it's not like he was as good of an athlete as like Vic or Lamar or fields. You know, he wasn't, wasn't that good, but man, he, he totally could have been, he he totally could have been a paradigm changer for the quarterback position a lot earlier than maybe a Vic was or or maybe a a Lamar was in terms of just the acceptance of a quarterback that runs and throws uh, being something the teams were okay with. Yeah. All right. Well, good stuff. Appreciate the questions uh, as always. So drop some more in the comments. Alan, tell the people they can find you. At A Saunders underscore PGH, PGH Steelers Now, SteelersNow.com. Like and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell for notifications. Another episode of Morning Rush coming at you tomorrow. Don't miss any of them. That's all I got. Yeah, there we go. And if you were listening somewhere else, be sure to subscribe over there. Leave us a five-star review over there. That includes Apple, Spotify, wherever you get your podcast from. Be sure to do that. And find us on TikTok, Steelers Afternoon Drive. You can find me everywhere, Zachary Smith, PGH. Found Sonny's and myself. Thanks for jumping in. Take another ride on the Steelers Afternoon Drive. 